Anyways, it's an honor to be here today. Do you love God's word? I love God's word. Let's turn to Romans chapter eight if you have a copy. If I was stranded on an island and they only gave me one chapter to hang on to for the rest of my life, uh, Romans chapter eight would be close to the top. And thank God we have the full counsel of God's word, but tonight we're just gonna look at Romans chapter eight. I'd like to look at what it means to have a spirit-led life or to be led by the spirit. In Romans chapter eight, verse one, it says, therefore, there is now. When is now? Now is now. Uh, right now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. The theological term is called atonement or the atoning sacrifice. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but how do we live? We live according to the Spirit. Let's jump to verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. I'd like to read that one all together out loud, the sound of one voice, one, two, three. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Father, we love your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains the same. And the fact that we could stand on its powerful truth to gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding every week is such a blessing. And so we surrender this sermon to you. We surrender our time to you. And we ask that you would lead us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. A couple years back, we had the bright idea to take all of the grandchildren, all of the cousins, and the grandparents to a theme park in Orlando. Now, some might call it a vacation, but my mother-in-law was there, so we call that a trip. <laughs> Big difference, all right? If your mother-in-law is there, it's a trip. If your mother-in-law's not there, it's a vacation. Just a joke, relax. <laughs> so as we're planning and preparing for this trip, it's gonna be about 10 of us going to a theme park. As you can imagine, the complexities that are involved in just one day at a theme park with 10 people, a buddy of mine found out and he said, hey, I." I have a, a new business that I think you should take advantage of if you're gonna take that many people to the theme park. And I said, tell me more. He said, it's called Sunshine Tours. And I said, okay, well, what, what does it consist of? He said, well, we serve people with means uh, that are well off. I'm like, well, hold on a second. That's not me. Uh, missionary kid, grew up, third generation missionary kid. So we don't know about what it means to have means or be well off, but keep going, I guess. And he goes, what they do is they... They hire us, they contract one of our liaisons for when they go to the park. And because their time is so limited, they live such busy lives. Instead of having to decide you know, where to go and what to do, our guide, our, our liaison takes all of that off of your shoulders and they'll do everything for you. All you have to do is just enjoy your day at the theme park. And he said, I'll give you the pastor discount. I like pastor discount. I'm like, all right. My barber gives me the pastor discount sometimes. My mortgage company does not give me the pastor discount. <laughs> and so he said, look for the lady in the yellow polo when you get there, the yellow you know, polo shirt. I said, okay, no problem. So we get on the ferry, we go across the little, little river there and we get there and sure enough, there is a lady in a yellow polo, Sunshine Tours with her name badge. And she said, are you the family? And we are the family. And she said, okay, give me your tickets. I'm like, all right, gave her our tickets. Like, We've never met this lady before giving her 10 tickets. She goes to the counter. She does a little thing. She got her app. She got the phone, da, 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 puts the tickets in her, in her pocket. She goes, come with me. And we go to the gate. And while, and while we're waiting for the gates to open, she said, now here's what's about to happen. When these gates open, every family is going to go to the left. But when these gates open, we are going to go to the right. And we're like, okay, no problem. So sure enough, gates open. Everybody funnels to the left. Our family goes to the right and we find ride one, ride two, and ride three, no wait time, no line. Like, this is awesome. Three rides in a row, no wait time. And it finally starts to occur to us that we need to use the restroom. And she, like a prophet says, don't you have to use the restroom by now? 
I'm like, how did you know? Sure enough, the restroom was right there. So ride one, ride two, ride three, restroom, done. She's like, all right, we're going to go ride three and ride four. It's like, okay, no wait time, ride three, no wait time. She's taking us through all the things. And then she's like, you're probably hungry for lunch. We're like, how did you know? She's like, here's the place with the chicken tenders. We're like, that's where we wanted to eat. She goes, sit in the corner. I'm going to go get you your chicken tenders. I'll be right back. She skips the line, goes through the side, has this little, I don't know what power she had or what kind of badge she, you know, showed, but whatever it was, she gets all the chicken tenders. We eat lunch. We have a good time. She goes, are you ready? We're ready to go. Ride, ride five, ride six, ride seven. No wait. We had finished every ride, went to the bathroom and ate lunch while everyone else was filing for divorce. We would walk by people and they would be arguing with each other. We would watch kids having a demonic attack in their stroller. And we were all like, yeah, we good. We got the lady in the yellow polo. What's up? And at the end of the day, my father-in-law, you know, we're just talking at dinner and we're like, man, you know what? That was really, really efficient. That was really, really good. The Holy Spirit is the same thing for your life. When everyone goes left, the Holy Spirit will lead you to the right. When everyone else is is lost their mind or lost their peace or lost their understanding, the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit serves as the liaison for your life here on earth so that you don't have to go the same way that the world does. The Holy Spirit is the distinctive that you carry as a believer, as someone who is in Christ. You can be led by the Spirit, which is great because sometimes we don't know what to do, but the Spirit will show us what to do and where to go. Because everyone is led by something. You know, some are led by sin. It doesn't take long, just walk right outside. You can see Just a lot of people that are led by sin, turn the television on, a lot of people led by sin. Many are led by others, but few are led by the Spirit. But I think I came to the right church tonight. I think I came to a place that says, you know what? We are the few and the faithful that will be led by the Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now, The next obvious question that I know you're asking is, so where does the Holy Spirit lead us? You ask such good questions. Yes, I knew that you were gonna ask that question, so I had them throw it up on the screen. Because I knew that you were gonna be like, okay, I like being led by the Spirit, but where are we going? Well, the Holy Spirit will lead you to Christ. First, the Spirit leads us to Christ. Romans chapter eight, verse three, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The spirit will always lead you to Christ. There is nothing about the spirit that will not lead you to Christ. You'll never wake up one day and say, the Holy Spirit is leading me away from Christ. That is not the spirit, that is the flesh. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to Christ. We can't do it on our own, so we need a helper and the spirit will always draw us towards Christ. Our flesh will be drawn towards sin, but our spirit will always lead us to Christ. A.W. Tozer said this, he goes, I don't want the world to define God for me. I want the Holy Spirit to reveal God to me. And the more the spirit leads you, the more you will find the fresh revelation of who Christ is. The more you are led by the Spirit, the more revelation you'll have of who Christ is. The second place the Spirit leads us is the Spirit leads us to peace. How many of you need peace? I don't know about you, but this world is crazy, y'all. I mean, people are crazy. But thank God that I don't have to walk in the same chaotic nature that the world walks in because I have the peace that the Spirit leads me to. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter six, Paul's writing to the people of Ephesus and he says, he says, lace up the gospel shoes of peace, which means everywhere I go, I can carry the peace of God with me. The spirit leads us to peace. It says this in, in verse five, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the 
spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. I don't know about you, but I want my mind to be at peace. And because I have made peace with God because of my salvation, I can now obtain the peace of God. Until you make peace with God, you can't have the peace of God. And there's no yoga studio, there's no gemstone, there's no horoscope or Facebook quiz that is going to give you the peace that God gives through his son, Jesus. Can I get an amen at this church? We need the peace, spirit leads us to peace. Not only do we receive peace, but then as believers, we are able to bring peace to every situation. So you can walk into a tense situation at your job, but you can be the bringer of peace. You can walk into a tense situation at home, but you can be the bringer of peace. Uh, essentially, you not only get to smoke it, you also get to sell it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Some of you are like, that's my testimony. I know exactly what you're talking about, preacher. I, did, I wasn't following along until just now. Now I get that. <laughs> I am not only a receiver of that peace, but I get to become a distributor of peace that peace. The third thing is this, is that the spirit will lead us to holiness. You know, that's a, not a very common word in most churches. I know this church is a Bible church, so you have no problem understanding what holiness is. But essentially, as you are in Christ and led by the spirit, your appetite for what you used to do will diminish and your appetite for the things of the Lord will increase. So you'll drive past places where you used to go party and say, I can't go there anymore. Because what that, what's happening inside of you is you're being drawn towards holiness. Another way to put this would be sanctification. You, you, you've, your soul has been saved and your mind is being sanctified. You are learning to live a life that is led by the Spirit. Now, some of you, if you're new to Christ, or maybe when you were first got saved, you were like, I'm saved, but I still cuss a little bit, you know? because your flesh is catching up to what your spirit has experienced. You know what I'm saying? And you need to know that it will always lead us to holiness. Romans 8, 12 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will die live. And so you begin to diminish the appetite for the things that you used to desire, and God changes your appetite for things that the Spirit desires. And this is a daily decision to crucify the flesh and to actually feed your spirit a life of holiness. Now, I'm not talking about old school holiness. I don't know how you grew up, but I was in church uh, nine months before I was born. I've, I've been to church a lot. My mom said, we're not even bringing this baby home before he's dedicated as a child. She went straight from the hospital to the baby dedication. So I see the mama, me see the mama. Right to it. Two days after I was born, they dedicated me as a child. She's like, he ain't coming into my house until he's set free, sanctified, <laughs> covered by the blood. Relax, I'm just a baby, you know? You know, I grew up in church, man. I, I mean, I, I, my parents were the pastors and so, I, I automatically assumed that the leftover communion was just a snack. Like I would just eat the body of Jesus. I was like, is it third Sunday? Cause I really want some Jesus. And thank God it was only Welch's grape juice cause we'd be in trouble. This six year old would feel real good after third Sunday communion. Cause I'd wash it down with the blood of God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I grew up in church, man. I thought the baptismal tank was our pool. I was like, it's baptism Sunday? I'll bring my bathing suit. <laughs> Man, and my, my mom, I don't know how, what, how you grew up, but I grew up like you couldn't wear jeans to church. Uh, you couldn't chew gum in church. Uh, you, you didn't have an option if you wanted to go to church or not. It wasn't even like, how are you feeling today? It was like, get up, and go to church, you know? I'm not talking about that kind of holiness. That kind of holiness can be seen kind of as like a, a religious spirit. I'm talking about the holiness that comes from the inside where the conviction sets in and you're like, I can't do 
what I used to do anymore because the spirit is leading me in a different direction. I'm sorry, I can't go to that party like I used to because the spirit is leading me in a different direction. I don't care whether you wear jeans or slacks or whatever to church. What I do care about is that anytime the appetite of the flesh begins to surface again, you would actually crucify the flesh and then increase your appetite for the things of holiness and the things of the Lord. Oswald Chambers said this, he said, holiness, not happiness, is the chief end of man. So the Holy Spirit is gonna point things out to you. When things are unclear, the Holy Spirit's gonna bring conviction to you. Here's the fourth one. The Spirit leads us to understanding our new identity. This is so good because we are no longer who we used to be. Aren't you grateful that you're not who you used to be? Once God got a hold of your life, once you realize the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, then you can be transformed into someone new. It says in verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. We are recipients. We receive, we we inherit heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we also might share in his glory. You are no longer a slave to fear. You are no longer a slave to that old identity of who you were. You are no longer a victim of the lies that your earthly father or the enemy spoke over you as a child. You have received the adoption papers into sonship. I am preaching tonight. Ain't nobody saying nothing. You are a son and daughter of God tonight. You have received a new name, a new identity. The old is gone and the new has come and the Holy Spirit will continually reveal this new identity to you. You say, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. I know that's not, I know God is revealing to me a new identity to a new understanding of who I am. Y'all still with me? All right, number five, the Spirit leads us to strength. See, there are moments of weakness. We all have them, but thank God that our God is strong. Thank God that he is mighty. Thank God that he is a strong tower and we can run to him and we could be safe. See, the spirit will always lead you to strength. The spirit will never hide your weakness, but it will always, always magnify his strength. Verse 26, it says this, in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He's our strength. And when you run out of words to pray, when you run out of words to say, when you get in a situation where you feel trapped down and out, the spirit takes over and begins to intercede on your behalf. He is the corner man. When you run out of strength, you can tag out and say, I'm done. I don't have anything else to give, but he becomes our strength. So you don't have to come to church yoked. I seen some of y'all. Yeah, I see you, bro. I saw you. You don't have to wave your hand. I saw you from when I walked in here. All right. You don't have to, you don't, you don't need to take HGH, you know, human growth hormone. You can just rest easy knowing that God's got this. Rest easy though. In your weakness, he is strong. Rest easy knowing that he's got you covered. And when you run out of words, the spirit will intercede with wordless groans. All right, here's the last one. The spirit leads us to our ultimate purpose. Aren't you glad we're not just in the waiting room for the rapture? I'm just gonna wait here, go to generation till Jesus comes back. I ain't doing nothing for God here on earth though. I'm just gonna sit here. He better come back quickly. I'm tired of sitting here. No, no, no. The Spirit leads us to our ultimate purpose. Did you know that there is a God-given assignment for every environment on your life? There is a call of God in this room over every single person. 
Look what it says here in verses 27 and 28. It says, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You have been called. Aren't you grateful that you are at a church that will actually assist you in helping you discover your God-given purpose? Aren't you glad that it's not just a one-man band, but instead it takes Team GC to rally up and say, we're gonna make sure that if I am called, I am on mission and I am on purpose. Some of you need to go ahead and step into G101. You've been waiting too long. You will never discover your ultimate purpose by staring at the back of someone's head for an hour and 15 minutes every single week. Your purpose is found when you actually exercise the God-given gift that he put inside of you for the sake of the kingdom. And some of you are so gifted and so anointed and God has really blessed you with an ultimate purpose. Even I couldn't even serve in kids. They would be bad. They'd be like, no, I'm not dropping my kid off. I'm like, nope, taking them into church today. But some of you, you could rock a baby to sleep in the nursery, no problem. You could teach kids the mysteries of God at their age level. Some of you can sing and, and can play instruments. Some of you can, can uh, ush or host. You could pass a bucket like a pro. Ain't no chicken bucket can be passed like you can pass a chicken bucket. You have an ultimate purpose and the spirit will lead you to that. You need to step into that. You have to actually step into that. All right. So now we know where we're led to, but how do we do this? I know, you know, I know what you're asking. You're probably asking like, how to be led by the Holy Spirit? It's like, how do we do this? I know you are, because I put it on the screen for you. <laughs> Very quickly, you have to release control. You, you can have spiritual growth or you can have control, but you can't have both. <laughs> it's like, nope, I'm not raising my hands. Only when they sing oceans at the bridge. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Other than that, nothing. I'm not letting the Spirit lead me anywhere. No, 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 you need to relinquish control. God, am I supposed to witness to this cashier at the grocery store? Am I supposed to tell my neighbor about Jesus today, even though he never puts his trash cans away? <laughs> you need to stop trying to control everything about your life and surrender it to God and say, God, I'm relinquishing control. And I'm saying, God, whatever it is that you have for me today, it's yours. You cannot lead a spirit-led life if you need to be in control of everything. Because if you're in control of everything, you become God and you're not God, neither am I. <laughs> so we have to surrender to the one who does control all things and we have to release control. Paul writes to another group of Christians in Galatia chapter five, and he says this in verse 16, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you, listen to me, young people, you are not to do whatever you want. Whew. If there's anything for 2023 that our culture and society needs to hear, that you cannot do whatever you want to do. Our flesh will be in conflict with our spirit, so we need to mature and understand where the spirit is leading us. And if our flesh is in control, then our spirit is not in control. So we need to say, God, well, I surrender first thing every morning before your feet hit the floor. Father, I surrender this day to you. Well, what is surrender? Surrender is a daily choice to let God lead. Surrender is a daily choice to let God lead. As your flesh tries to creep in to take over, you say, no, 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 I'm surrendered to God. I give him my life. I give him my purpose. I give him my job. I give him everything about me. The second thing you need to do is you need to watch and pray. You need to watch and pray. Every Every environment you go into, every room you walk into, you need to prayerfully consider what could possibly God could use you to do in that room. 
You need to watch and pray. You need, to, you need to keep your eyes open and alert. You don't need to be just like, okay, I'm not a Christian in this room. I'm not even gonna let the Holy Spirit lead me. I'm just gonna go do my thing and go back home. No, no, no. You need to pray with your eyes open everywhere you go. You're like, okay, I'm at the, I'm at the mom's group now. I'm watching and praying. Is there anyone who looks like they need to be ministered to today? I, I'm, I'm at the grocery store. I'm, is there anyone that needs to be ministered to today? And what you do is you start to yield. It's called yielding to the Holy Spirit. You're not stopping abruptly and you're not flying through red lights, but what you're doing is you're moving and you're watching. You're moving and you're, wa you're watching and you're praying. And when you watch and you pray, you start to see people's countenance and you're like, hey, something doesn't seem right. Is there anything I can do for you today? You learn to watch and pray because if you don't watch and pray, you end up falling asleep. That's what happened to the people closest to Jesus at the moment where he needed them the most. So they, they, they did not yield to the leading of the spirit. Instead, they fell asleep, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right, release control, watch and pray. Here's the third one. You need to take a risk. You know how you spell faith? R-I-S-K. We're not here to play it safe. We didn't come here to be like, okay, now that I'm saved, I'm just gonna coast for the rest of my life. We're not waiting to skate on the gold streets of heaven. We're gonna step in to do things that have never been done before because we're gonna reach people that have never been reached before. We're gonna do great things for God here on earth until he returns. We're gonna take a risk. My wife and I started our church 10 years ago when we were 24 years old our frontal cortex hadn't even been fully developed. So we were making faith-filled, dumb decisions. Like, yeah, let's just plant a church place we never lived before. Let's just start, you know? We just moved into the first place that didn't do a credit check. Found a lady, she like didn't check our credit. We're like, I guess this is God's will because we'd be homeless if she knew how broke we were. I mean, we had nothing. It was a big faith move. It was a big step of faith. I, I, I didn't know what to do at 24 years old with three children. I found myself working at Panera Bread for $7.24 an hour. Asking myself, is this really God's will for my life? And I remember having to go to my manager at the Panera Bread and say, sir, instead of throwing the leftover bagels into the dumpster tonight, would you mind just leaving them next to the dumpster? so that I don't have to jump into the dumpster. When my shift's over, I can just pick them up. We only had one car at the time. I would walk home with a trash bag full of bagels because I knew that my life needed to fit within the confines of this book at the end of it, and it would require a step of faith and a level of risk. So some of you need to take a risk. For some of you, that risk is to start to serve. For some of you, that risk is to, is to step into joining a group uh, this semester when they start. For some of you, that is to start to give or, or tithe. Well, I don't know what the faith step is that God is calling you to take, but you have to take a risk. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says it this way. He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's time to get to work, church. It's time to step up. It's time to put on the shoes of peace and go into the world that needs us and take a risk. See, the spirit is too powerful and our salvation is too significant for us to play it safe. It's like, I just wanna be comfortable. Well, no, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. So why would you need a comforter? I think they put it on the screen. Why would you need a comforter? if what we are called to do is comfortable. You're called to take a risk. And when you feel uncomfortable, the comforter will come. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. So what is the risk that is in front of you right now? Take the risk. Maybe it's water baptism. Maybe it's signing up to serve. Maybe it's praying with your wife out loud every single day. Maybe it's turning off the radio and interceding over your children. Maybe it's stopping some of those habits that you know aren't leading you to holiness and to start getting into God's word. The last thing is this, relying on God's power. You rely on God's power. Second to last thing, I, I'll add one more at the end. Rely on God's power. See, here's why risks seem kind of like dumb sometimes. 
Because we look at our own limitations void of God's power. And we say, of course I can't do that. And you're right. In and of yourself, you cannot do it. But when you rely on God's power, what is impossible becomes possible because you are led by the spirit and it is in your weakness where he becomes your strength. And you say, I can't do this on my own, but with you, God, everything, all things are possible. (laughs) Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, And in chapter 12, verse nine, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own power, but you don't have to because you can rely on God's power and his strength will make up for all our weakness. See, a life of faith lived utterly dependent on God. See, its failure is inevitable without his intervention. Failure is inevitable without his intervention. You're like, I'm gonna take a step of faith, do it, and then rely on him to come through in the end. I'm gonna ask the keyboard player to return, make me sound more spiritual than I really am. Hey. Good to see you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you very much. The last thing we have to do is we gotta give God the glory. Some of you have more degrees than a thermometer, I know. You got more accolades, you're so good. I mean, you got, you got all the stuff, man. And you do, you're gifted, you're talented. But our job is not to absorb glory. Our job is to reflect glory. Our, our, our job is not to absorb glory recognition. Our job is to reflect recognition. So every promotion, every time you meet your quota, every time you exceed those goals, every time God blesses you, every time you step into a brand new season, it's not me, it's God. And what will happen is, is you start to give God the glory for everything in your life because you realize that your life is so led by the Spirit. It's so contingent on the favor of God. You can't help but give God glory. You gotta give God the glory. See, the quickest way for the spirit to stop leading your life is for you to start taking all the credit. Let me say that one more time. The quickest way for the spirit to stop leading your life is for you to start taking all the credit. Galatians 5.25, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. And let us not become conceited or provoking and envying each other. It is not about you. And it is not about me. It's not even about us. It's about him. I'm not here to absorb accolades or followers or comments or likes or subscribers or whatever. I am here to reflect the glory of God. God calls us to do things that are beyond our ability so that he can get all the glory. Aren't you grateful for that? That the glory of God can be reflected. Let's stand to our feet. And I'd like to read you this last verse as we close. I love God's word. It says in Romans 8, chapter 11, it says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Come on, let's give God some praise today.